this motivational speaker, you name it. It's kind of like the Swiss Army knife of, uh, of entertainers. Please welcome the fabulous Mr. Will Wheaton. gamers swearing at each other <laughs> metal guitars play obnoxiously. Uh, as Larry said, I am delighted for you to video uh, record and audio record this. I just ask that if you put it online, please release this under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share Alike License. If you don't know what that means, go to creativecommons.org and all will be explained to you. You will also find a whole bunch of amazing works of art that are released under similar uh, licenses. You'll be happy that you read that. Normally, when I uh, when I come to a convention to uh, to, to speak to you, I uh, bring some of the stories that I've written, and I read a little bit, and then spend the remainder of the time uh, taking questions from the audience. I did that yesterday and had a really good time doing it, and I would like to do it again today. Um, so I have uh, uh, this is my dog, Seamus. I know, right? I'm, the only, I'm not the only person who does that, right? You see pictures of your pets and you talk to them like they can hear you? They say I'm not the only one. Because if I'm the only one, I'm in a room full of liars. And you should all be ashamed of yourself. Um, a couple of years ago, I, uh, I, I wrote a book called The Happiest Days of Our Lives. And it's a collection of essays about the things that bring me joy in life. It's about uh, growing up in the 70s and then coming of age in the 80s as a member of the uh, geek subculture in Generation X. And uh, a lot of the material that is in this was originally published. I was a columnist for the uh, LA Weekly for a long time. I was a columnist for Suicide Girls for a long time. And I collected a lot of the things that I, I had written. I rewrote them, polished them, and put them into this book. And I wanted to uh, share with you a story that, that I wrote, it's, I guess it's an essay. Uh, it's an essay I wrote about going to conventions. <coughs> I noticed a thing yesterday when I was walking through the halls here. Um, I've been going to conventions since I can remember. Uh, I, I think the first time I went to a con was when I talked my parents into dropping me off at a hotel for a day. Uh, uh, and assured them that I, I wasn't you know, going to go anywhere or uh, I, I don't care how good the candy sound that I was not going to get into the van. <laughs> uh, and I was left with a pocket full of dimes so that I could use the pay phone to check in every two hours. Kids, ask your parents. <laughs> and, uh, and I loved them. And uh, something changed with conventions. Uh, around 1990, and I think it's attributed, attributable to a number of facts, um, or a number of factors, rather. Uh, uh, a big uh, corporation kind of ran a lot of local promoters out of business. Uh, a few uh, unscrupulous people down in the United States, I don't know if this happened in Canada, but down in the U.S., a couple of really unscrupulous people uh, basically just stole from, from everyone and really wounded fandom. Um, and then some other things happened that I talk about in this essay. And cons really changed. They sort of became sort of like, uh, they, were, they were either like marketplaces or autograph shows or uh, something that kind of unsatisfying. They lost that sense of let's take over a hotel for a weekend and not be ashamed to love the things we love. Yeah. And that's what I love about conventions. That's why I went when I was a kid. Um, it was a place I could go and I could be the biggest nerd in the world, and there was somebody there who was nerdier than I was. <laughs> I didn't have to worry about cool kids making fun of me uh, for the clothes that I wore, or uh, the like weird devotion I had to uh, uh, Star Wars. <laughs> and, uh, it was like, it was just really wonderful. 
beautiful. And as I was walking through the hallway yesterday, uh, I said to, to Carrie, who's taking care of me this weekend, Polaris is the first convention I've been to in probably 20 years that has the same spiritual center and sense of identity that the cons that I loved. <laughs> you should find the find volunteers and and and, and staff and the and the, and the, the and like the, the board members and thank them. Because I, I, it sounds like you don't take it for granted, but it's easy to take it for granted. When you have an awesome con that you can go to year after year, you just start to think, oh great, that's where I'm going. Uh, but it's it's uncommon. It's it's less common than you think. It's less common than it should be. And you guys are very, very lucky that you have this to come to. Yeah. So with, uh, with that in mind, I would like to read to you uh, a part of a, a story from my book, The Happiest Days of Our Lives. It's called Beyond the Room of the Starlight. Shortly after we began production on Next Generation, people who had been associated with the series for a long time, actors, creative department heads, producers and writers, asked us if we'd been approached about going to conventions to promote the show. The rest of the cast didn't know what a Star Trek convention was, but I did. <laughs> because I'd been attending comic book and horror conventions since I was in the sixth grade. My parents gave me permission to go to the Fangoria Weekend of Horrors convention at the Ambassador Hotel. Conventions are awesome, I said at the end of a table read when the subject came up. There's all these people, and you can watch movies and buy cool stuff, and I'll bet you they will even let us in for free. <laughs> I was a naive 14-year-old, and it didn't occur to me that if the adults in the cast spent one of their days off promoting the show, they would expect compensation that was a bit more substantial than free admission. <laughs> the first time I was on stage at a Star Trek convention was in Anaheim, California, home of Disney, right around the time Next Generation premiered. I wasn't there officially, but my friend and I had gone to check it out so that if I was asked to attend Star Trek conventions in the future, I'd know what I was getting into. Star Trek conventions, he told me, were very different from the comic book and horror movie conventions I was used to. The promoter found out I was wandering the show after I paid my own admission and offered me the glorious, unimaginable sum of $100 in cash <laughs> to speak for an hour. To a 14-year-old who thought an $8 admission refund was a jackpot. A <laughs> hundred bucks rhymed with one million. Without knowing how badly I was being ripped off and taken advantage of, I gleefully accepted his generous offer and did my best to answer questions for an hour. If you think it went well, you haven't spent any quality time recently around a 14-year-old. <laughs> but I got a hundred bucks. <laughs> which I immediately invested in the local economy at the dealer's room. <laughs> when I went to work the following Monday, some of the Trek veterans who had originally asked us about cons let me know how badly I'd been had. They put me in touch with people who could arrange for me to travel all over the country to a different city each weekend if I wanted to promote Next Generation, to meet fans, and to tuck a little money away for college, maybe even a house someday. Conventions were different in the late 1980s. One company called Creation used licensing agreements yeah. with Viacom and exclusivity agreements with actors to force just about all of the regional promoters out of the market. Back then, there were as many convention promoters as there were holiday inns in the country that were willing to host a few hundred Trekkies for a weekend. And every single con had its own unique feeling and its own local fan base. I remember going to a convention in Philadelphia with my mom. She got food poisoning. <laughs> I don't remember a thing about the convention itself. But I can still see and feel the waiting room and the emergency room. Dark wood on the walls, Old magazines on the table and chairs, ugly white and yellow linoleum tiles on the floor. I spent the entire night playing Tetris on my Game Boy, 
and listening to the final cut on my Walkman. Walkman's sort of like an iPod that only... <laughs> trying not to be too freaked out that my mom was in the hospital and we were a million miles away from home. When I was a kid, the default value for a lot was one million. <laughs> Stupid inflation. <laughs> when I was 18 or 19 years old, I learned that when you are on stage, if the microphone you're holding looks like a magic wand massager, it is not the smartest thing to tell the audience, oh, look at this, I'm talking into a marital aid. <laughs> Especially when you are in America's Bible Belt. Oh. <laughs> it was weird, I remember all the housewives like getting really interested in the floor. <laughs> My husband's looking confused. <laughs> I remember flying to New Jersey to appear at a convention with Marina Sirtis. We played head-to-head -head Tetris on our Game Boys the entire flight. I had a massive crush on her back then. And though the thought crossed my mind for most of the journey, I didn't have the courage or the nerve to suggest strip head-to-head -head Tetris when we arrived. <laughs> I'd just like to be clear, though, that according to 16-year-old me, had I asked, it totally would have happened. <laughs> Once, I was in Oklahoma. I was a guest at a dinner where I sat with a few other Star Trek actors while some Boy Scouts served us. The menu had barbecued chicken, barbecued beef, and barbecued bologna. <laughs> Wait, I remember asking the kid who was about the same age as me, barbecued bologna? Yes, he said, it's center cut. <laughs> something I wanted to eat, <laughs> regardless of its cut or how it was prepared. <laughs> the problem, however, was that barbecued bologna was a local delicacy, <laughs> and I was seated at the head table. It seemed like every bologna-loving eye in the hall was watching to see what I did. I ate it. I pretended to like it. Until I wrote this paragraph, nobody was the wiser. <laughs> there was a convention in Pasadena for years called LostCon, put on by the Los Angeles Science Fiction Society. I went there right after I'd gotten my driver's license in my first car, which was a totally bitchin' 1989 Honda Prelude SI four-wheel steering, one step better than Patrick Stewart's Honda Prelude SI that did not have four-wheel steering. <laughs> <laughs> I met my very first science fiction idol, the author Larry Niven. The meeting went something like this. Me. Oh my god, you're Larry Niven! <laughs> Kim. Oh my god, you're Wesley on Star Trek! <laughs> Both. What? <laughs> Both. Can I have your autograph? <laughs> Both. Yes! <laughs> Both. Cool! <laughs> I still have the copies of Ringworld and Ringworld Engineers that he signed for me. This is a fun story that is entirely true that is not in this book, but is considered a footnote for the purposes of this discussion. A number of years ago, my friend Cory Doctorow was nominated for a Nebula Award. He lives in England. The Nebula Awards were in Los Angeles. He asked me if I would go accept on his behalf. I said, of course I'll go accept on your behalf. He said, I'm not going to win because no one there likes me. <laughs> but I was nominated, and a speech should be prepared just in case. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll do that. And he said, so I'll make all the arrangements, you go to the dinner. And I said, great, let's do that. fantastic. <laughs> so uh, I asked my wife to go as my date. We went <laughs> to the Nebula Awards dinner, and I sat in a room about this size with every science fiction author I loved. It was, it was amazing. I thought, if a suitcase bomb goes off in this room, like, Robert Ludlum's going to be the best science fiction author in the world. That's just not right. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Crichton's going to shoot up the list. And that, that cannot happen. <laughs> Procured 
bomb sniffing dogs at my own expense. <laughs> totally worth it. So we're sitting at this table. We're seated, uh, seated with David Gerald, who's a friend of mine from Star Trek. And Larry Niven and his wife come and sit at the table, and, and, and Larry sits down next to my wife Anne. My wife Anne is not a nerd, she's a normal person. <laughs> my friends say that we are in a mixed marriage. <laughs> And turns to Larry Niven and says, So, uh, do you live around here? <laughs> he says, Yeah, I live in wherever city he lives. And she goes, Oh, so what do you do? <laughs> to Larry Niven in the room full of science fiction authors. And Larry Niven says, Oh, I'm, I'm an author. And she says, Bless her. Oh, my husband's an author, too. <laughs> she didn't tell me that this happened until after the reveal was over. Which is good. Because I wouldn't have been able to digest it. I still have the copies of Ringworld and Ringworld Engineers that Larry signed for me at that convention. Now, they weren't all good times. While most of the cons were fantastic, run by guys who really cared about fans and wanted them to have a good time, others were pretty awful, run by complete crooks who wanted to take the fans' money and get out of town before anyone figured out what they were up to. There are a couple of guys who still owe a lot of fans and actors money that none of us will ever see. One of those guys, in the pre-internet days, convinced 15-year-old me that it was a very short drive from Amarillo to Denton, Texas. Now, just to provide a bit of scale for you, that's like saying it is a very short drive from Toronto to Saskatchewan. <laughs> Not having the good sense to look on a map for myself, I agreed to do two different cities in two different days. As the drive across Texas entered its third hour without a single recognizable sign of civilization other than Dairy Queen and Stuckies, I learned an important lesson about never trusting anyone. On countless occasions, a promoter would tell fans that one of us was coming to a show, take fans' money, and then claim that we had canceled at the last minute. Of course, the only time any of us heard about the existence of that show was when irate fans wanted to know why we backed out of it. Really, of all the things the internet has made possible, it's the ability to stop shit like that from happening. That is really <laughs> now, for you damn kids today who've always had email and the internet and a cell phone, it may be hard to picture a world where a Game Boy was high tech, but that's where I came of age. The world seemed bigger than it does today. And from time to time, I miss driving straight from Paramount to Los Angeles International Airport on Friday after work and falling asleep on the red eye somewhere over New Mexico, still wearing Wesley Crusher's helmet hair. <laughs> that's the end of that. I mean, there's more, but that's where I choose to stop. <laughs>